Joined now by David Sachs of Craft Ventures and the co-host of the All In podcast, as well as a big presence on Twitter. Hello, David. Thank you for joining me. I'm very glad you did. Good to be here. Thanks, you. Now, I've spent a lot of time with some of your friends like Peter Thiel, and uh, I just got off an hour-long interview with Tristan Harris of the Center for Humane Technology. Are you familiar with Tristan? I don't think so. I'm not, uh, not that I know of. Okay, well, I, I am only learning about the All In podcast, and I listened to the Vivek interview with great interest yeah. because I interviewed him yesterday. And then I listened to the Bill Gurley interview with even more interest. But I have a problem. I don't know your voice yet. The only time I'd ever heard your voice was on the Twitter thing with Ron DeSantis. It was so choppy. I couldn't get a good, a good, I've been doing this for 33 years, but I still couldn't get it in. When you were doing biographies, which was really the most interesting part of both podcasts, Somebody said they liked Shoe Dog, Man in the Arena, and Hamilton. Was that you? Um, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, no, I don't think so. Wait, so a voice uh, said that that those were, um, oh, that, that those uh, were books that they liked. Biographies. You guys were biographies. talking about biographies. Yes, I think that was a friend of a friend of mine, uh, Brad Gerstner, who was also on the pod. So yeah, no, unfortunately, that that was not me. <laughs> okay, so tell me what biographies you read, because I actually think it's one of the most interesting questions you can ask somebody. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a bunch. I don't read as many as I as I used to. Um, I guess probably the best biography I read. Well, I, I really like Gore Vidal's Lincoln, which is historical uh, sure. fiction. Um, I like I his like Burr, his... even though it's counterfactual, but I like Burr. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like the first man in Rome series actually. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, we are like soulmates. Yeah. You know, why is that not on audiobook? You can only read them twice. You can't, you, I could listen to them endlessly and get the pronunciations done, but that's a seven book series, which is fabulous. Yeah. It's all Plutarch and Tacitus made real. So that's a very good, yeah. uh, interesting. Yeah. Book. I, yeah. I love that series. Um, you know, it kind of, it goes from Marius to, uh, Caesar to Augustus, that whole sort of last century, the Roman. Republic. It ends with Augustus. Yeah. And yeah. after that, if one yeah. goes off, you can, you can read further, but historical fiction does a very good job. Um, I'm curious, have you read any of Churchill, like the three bo- uh, uh, volume Manchester book? Yes. Churchill? I was going to mention that uh, the alone uh, book, the one from, was it like 1933 to 1940, basically talking about the wilderness yes. years. Yeah. I'm a big fan of that. And I was going to mention that book too. The reason I bring that up is because I'm very familiar with your stance on Ukraine. And I think Mm -hmm. if Winston Churchill could channel in right now, he would say, you're forgetting the Sudetenland. You're forgetting the Anschluss. (laughs) You're forgetting Munich, David. You're forgetting everything I tried to warn Neville about. And before him, Stanley Baldwin. How would you respond to that ghost? Well, I mean, this is always the the neocon argument is that it's always- I'm not a neocon. I'm a Reagan conservative. Okay, well- uh, let's let's just say that this is always the the argument that you hear is that it's always 1938 that our enemy is is always Hitler, and engaging in any diplomacy whatsoever would be akin to appeasement and and your Neville Chamberlain, and so this is this is what I've been hearing throughout this this war, and what I would just say is that every historical circumstance is different. I think you know I'm very familiar with what happened in World War II and what led up to it, and I just think that the situation we have today really bears no resemblance to that. I don't think the idea that um, that Putin is is Hitler is a serious argument. I don't think that this is primarily a war of conquest. I think the, the cause the causes of this war have been known for for decades, which it mainly has to do with Russian security concerns, which the West continuously ignored. We ignored the advice of George Kennan in the 1990s in bringing NATO right up to Russia's door. He predicted that would be a tragic mistake that would end in hostilities. We ignored the advice of our own ambassador to Moscow in 2008, Bill Burns, who's now the CIA director, who told us that uh, expanding NATO uh, to Ukraine was a red line for, for the Russians, not just Putin, but the entire Russian elite. It was absolutely a red line for Gorbachev and Yeltsin as well as as well as various liberal reformers inside of Russia. We ignored the advice of Kissinger and uh, Mearsheimer, Professor Mearsheimer in 2014, who warned us we were headed for this war. 
unless we agree to make uh, Ukraine a neutral country. And instead, we ignored all of this advice for many years, and we persisted in this crusade to bring Ukraine into NATO and basically turn it into a giant military base on Russia's most vulnerable border. And not surprisingly, Russia reacted quite negatively to this, as was predicted many times over the years by all the experts I mentioned, including many others. And yet we again, we persist in this policy and and the results now have been disastrous. We're in this war. Uh, It's going very badly. I think the war is an absolute disaster for Ukraine. Uh, I think that the administration was pinning its hopes uh, on a successful counteroffensive. Remember the narrative we were told for the whole last year, or at least certainly since the fall, since Kharkiv, was that we were going to arm the Ukrainians. We We appropriated over $100 billion to them. And the idea was that we would have this successful spring counteroffensive. The uh, Ukrainians, with the help of American armor and weapons, would punch through the Russian lines. They would scatter. They would turn tail and run. They would be disorganized. They were demoralized and ineffective and corrupt. And that within a period of even three to four days, you'd see significant progress. And within a couple of months, the Ukrainians would be at the Sea of Azov. They would cut off the land bridge to Crimea. Uh, and the Russians would have to sue for peace, and that was going to be the end of this whole matter. Well, obviously, that hasn't worked out. Um, where we, things stand today is that the counteroffensive have moved incredibly slowly. Uh, even publications like CNN and the Washington Post, which are incredibly pro-Ukraine, are admitting that the reports from the battle lines are sobering, that the losses have been staggering, uh, that the Ukrainians have made little progress. And there is no serious prospect for them making serious, for retaking territory in a serious way. So what you're starting to hear now are words like quagmire. Uh, you're starting to you know, hear, hear words like, uh, you know, this is going to be a multi-year war. They're already giving up on this year that now they're, they're planning for next year. And, uh, and once again, the United States has found itself in another quagmire. So, and, and not to mention that Ukraine's has been completely destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. Over 10 million of their population are now refugees. They've had to flee the country. The infrastructure has been destroyed. The economy has been destroyed. Uh, and again, they're not retaking this, this territory. So I think at some point we're going to have to recognize that we are going to have to do what we always needed to do, which was engage in serious diplomacy to solve this conflict. And sadly, we're only going to recognize that fact, I think, after this country is completely destroyed and uh, the West has basically fought to the last Ukrainian. So let me say what I always like to tell. (laughs) Well, I like to tell my audience it's not a debate, it's an interview. I want to know what you think and why you think. I get three hours a day, five days a week to tell people why I think we ought to arm the Ukrainians. So I don't need to debate you. I want to know what you think. Vivek was on Wednesday. And he told me he wants a, uh, to impose a peace in place and deal with Putin, disengage him from China. And we talked for 45 minutes. He had another engagement. And I didn't really get into the specifics of how he would propose to do that. Now, you're close with Governor DeSantis. Governor DeSantis regrets, I know, the territorial dispute. I don't hold that against him. I think he's talking about diplomacy at a more higher range. But in your mind, you've, you've taken companies from zero to great success. How do you get from where we are to where you think we want to get to? I mean, just in your mind, what do you think happens here? If someone adopted the David Sachs plan? Well, I think that we're in a very tough position now because the deal that we can get today is not the deal that we could have gotten back in March or April of uh, 2022. And it's certainly not the deal we could have gotten in mid-2021 when Biden had the summit with Putin. I think we could resolve this matter uh, very easily. What the Russians were looking for again, throughout 2021, and they made this really clear in a draft treaty they proposed in December of 2021, is the most important thing is they wanted a written guarantee that we would not bring Ukraine into NATO. Secondarily, they were very concerned about our placement of dual-use missiles, uh, missile launchers, in uh, NATO countries like Poland and Romania. Uh, I think we could have negotiated on those points too. I don't know why we had to abrogate the ABM and INF treaties, but that's sort of a separate matter. But the main thing they wanted, their primary concern was about NATO expansion. And I do not think that it would have cost us much of anything to make that, to give them that assurance. But instead, 
the administration took the point of view that there can be no change, there will be no change, that we are committed to this idea of an open door policy for NATO. Uh, this is what Blinken said. And we categorically refuse to negotiate on the, the question of whether NATO's door would remain open. And yet today, after Vilnius, there is no prospect of bringing Ukraine into NATO. Jens Stoltenberg himself said that Ukraine would not be joining NATO unless and until they win this war. But there is no prospect for them winning this war. We are out of ideas, frankly, on how to help them. And so, so David, no, if you got, yeah. if Ron DeSantis became president and he said, David, I want you to be my Harry Hopkins. You don't have to live at the White House, but you're going to be my Harry Hopkins. Go wherever you need to go to make the world safer for America's national security. Where would you go and what would you ask for? Well, let me just say, to be clear, because you mentioned DeSantis a couple of times, I, I have supported him and I do support him because I think he's done an excellent job in, in Florida. I don't Superb. Want, I'm neutral. Yeah, I don't want to give the impression that somehow I'm like a foreign policy advisor to him or something like that, because he has his own views and he needs to speak for himself on this issue. Um, you know, what, what I would recommend is, and I think Vivek was on to something here, is that one of the really negative consequences, one of the many negative consequences of our handling of Ukraine and this war is that we have absolutely pushed Russia into the arms of the Chinese. And China really is, it being the only real peer competitor to the U.S. in the world, it really should be the primary focus of U.S. security. And, you know, the strategy we should have pursued, and I think Vivek made this point, is it should have been more akin to what Nixon did with China, which is we, we always try to divide the Soviet Union and China, not have them link arms. And notably, we tried to do that even though they were both communist countries. And, you know, whatever you think of Putin and, and Russia today, uh, it, it, it's the authoritarian nature of Russia today. It pales in comparison to the totalitarian, totalitarian nature of the Soviet Union or, or Mao's China back then. And so this idea that we somehow couldn't make a deal with Putin when we could make a deal with Mao. I don't, I don't accept that. I think there was a deal to be made. And I think Vivek is right that we need to stop pushing Russia into China's arms where I think maybe he's being, maybe where he's simplifying is this idea that this is something we can fix overnight. I think the best you know, we can I, hope for, I think the best Vivek we can hope a, for. Well, Vivek he's is a very fast learner. Right? He, he's a very fast learner, but he's still yeah. got a lot to learn. Uh, and he's drawn a red line around Taiwan, but he's going to erase it as soon as we are semiconductor independent. That didn't go over too well when I talked with him on Wednesday among the national security crowd, which you call the blob, and it can be sometimes the blob. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, but vis-a-vis -vis yeah. Xi, who makes Mao look like a piker, Xi is our, is our 1938. Putin is our 1914. And uh, if, if there's a book called The Sleepwalkers by Kenneth Clark, which I'll recommend to you, David, but I'm going to go back. We are where we are. We can't go back in the Wayback Machine to two years ago. Tom Cotton said we could have deterred this completely by not leaving Kabul and giving it to the Taliban and inviting the Chinese and take Bagram. I don't know who's right. We are where no, we are. That's, so you're that, Harry that's Hopkins. Not that's not correct. Listen, well, oh, okay. the, the, let, me, let me address that point. I mean, the, the rhetoric that you hear from neocons, and what I mean by that is hardline militarists, and I would include Tom Cotton in that. And look, I like Senator Cotton in other ways. Okay. I don't want to be. Would you disturbed. define hardline militarist for me? It's somebody who who perceives the world in a very hawkish way and wants America's first response to any uh, any uh, international crisis to be militaristic versus diplomatic. Um, and I and would further say, and, and this is the point I want to make about deterrence, is that they have a tendency to think that any bad thing that happens in the world occurs because the U.S. failed to project power. In other words, it failed to deter. And therefore, the only thing the U.S. needs to do is be strong. And, you know, and again, that every bad thing that happens is because somehow we were weak. I think that is silly. I think that uh, that other nations, especially um, great powers, have their own interests. Some of those interests they consider to be existential for themselves, and therefore they cannot be deterred in a simple way from pursuing those those issues that they believe to be existential for themselves. Furthermore, I would just say that this uh, this type of thinking 
uh, has a horrible track record. I mean, look at where the United States is after 20 some odd years of pursuing this hardline, uh, knee jerk, militaristic, reactionary foreign policy. It's got us into, it got us into Iraq. It kept us in Afghanistan for 20 years. It got us involved in Syria. It uh, got us involved in Libya. It's been one fiasco after another. Millions of people around the world have been killed. We have thousands of uh, of our own casualties and, and horribly wounded veterans suffering from PTSD to this day. We destabilized the entire Middle East, uh, creating this huge refugee problem that persists in Europe. So this type of thinking uh, has really done nothing but give us one disaster after another. And yet it's the same people, the same foreign policy establishment, and the same uh, government bureaucrats who have administered and led us to the situation we have in Ukraine. This is, again, another neocon folly that, and maybe it'll be the last neocon folly that's been perpetrated. Now, neocon is, is it, it's a loaded word, and I, I don't like to use it because there are Reagan conservatives and there are neocons. The Reagan counter. Victoria Newland is definitely a Victoria Newland is definitely a neocon. She started as Dick Cheney's foreign policy advisor. She was arguing for Iraq, telling us lies like uh, Saddam had WMD. It was in cahoots with. Not a lie. If you're wrong, it's not a lie, right? If you're just wrong, because the entire well, foreign policy establishment, including Bill Burns, who you've spoken of, well, they all believed he had WMD. We were wrong, led to bad choices. But I want to go back to the end of the Cold uh, well, War. Why do you I, think that I, I, US- I think that when Donald's when Donald Rumsfeld said things like that he not only Saddam not only has WMD, but we know where they are. I yes. think that has to be a lie. I think that was it's a not lie. a lie. I, that, we disagree, but again, it's not a debate. I want I want to know why you think the Soviet Union fell apart. Was it because of Reagan's peace through strength? Because I think you said on the pod that you fear the military industrial complex. Was that you? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm certainly not the first to say it. Eisenhower said it, and he certainly knew what yeah, he was talking about. Yeah, but he said it about. when we were spending, when I spent, said that, <laughs> we were spending 11.3% of GDP on on national defense. We're spending 2.7% of GDP on national defense this year. Yeah. Listen, I think if your point is that, uh, do I believe in peace through strength? Am I a fan of Ronald Reagan? The answer is yes. Uh, but But part of the reason why I am a fan of Reagan, and this is where I think his legacy has been misappropriated by some of the people we're talking about, is that Reagan at the end of the day was a peacemaker. That when Gorbachev came along and Margaret Thatcher told him, this is a man we can do business with, Reagan sat down and made peace. And he ignored some of the hardliners in his own administration who basically didn't, who were too suspicious. And Reagan sat down and signed uh, arms control treaties and made peace with Gorbachev. He seized the opportunity. Moreover- That's when actually reform- incorrect, David. David, that's incorrect. You, you know Reykjavik at all? Yeah, so Reykjavik. Peace. What do you, you think happened think at Reykjavik? We we ba- we signed arms control agreements with Gorbachev. No, no, it, it ended it ended with Gorbachev leaving in anger and Reagan leaving in anger and Richard Pearl, who was the ki- Prince of Darkness, was there leaving disappointed. They worked on the bathroom tub. I was in the administration. It was an utter and complete failure. And there was no peace agreement with the Soviet Union. What happened in 1989, managed by George H.W. Bush, is that Reagan's SDI and the investment in American strength brought about a competition that the USSR could not win except for Glasnost, but then they could not control Glasnost once it began and a totalitarian state fell apart. We didn't have to go to war. We did go to war in Grenada. We did supply the Afghans with weaponry uh, to fight the Soviet occupiers of of the Afghanistan Peninsula. He wasn't a pacifist, and he didn't do a deal with Gorbachev. So if you make that kind of a, if someone does a presentation to you at Kraft, and they get a basic fact wrong, how do you respond? I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm just Googled INF Treaty, 1987, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. That's not it's Reykjavik. by the United States. It's, I didn't say it was That's Reykjavik. That's not Reykjavik. about Reykjavik. We were discussing well, Reykjavik Reagan's is legacy. when Gorbachev... Uh, uh, Gorbachev wanted Reagan to abandon SDI in exchange for significant cuts. The INF does achieve parity, but it did not do what Reykjavik proposed, and that was not making peace the INF. I, I just, what do you do we're, if we're someone debating, gets We're debating tactical issues here of how Reagan brought about the these agreements with Gorbachev. I don't, to me, I don't 
really care about what happened at Reykjavik, what didn't happen at Reykjavik. My point is that when Reagan had the opportunity to make peace, he did. He seized the opportunity. No, no. It, Reagan, Reagan that, was a peacemaker. It, 1987, INF Treaty. What am I getting wrong that's, here? That's that is fundamentally wrong. He would not give Gorbachev what he wanted. He did not mind the INF deal. And how do we, because we how, had do already, we? how do we sign that treaty? Because we had deployed the perishing twos and the cruise missiles to Europe, and then we were willing to agree on limits on the number and types of uh, intermediate nuclear range. But he first acted with strength towards Europe. And how do you deal with the counterfactual that he put arms? I never, I never said, of- I never said, I told you I agree with peace through strength. I, you know, like Trump says, I want our military so powerful we never have to use it. Obviously, but he gave strong. all that weaponry to the Afghan Mujahideen. Now we left and we screwed it up after the Soviet Union fell apart. But was that a good move by Reagan to arm the Mujahideen? Maybe, but we remember we did this in a completely different way than we're doing Ukraine right now. I think you're referring to Operation Cyclone. It was a CIA, CIA covert operation. We gave them stingers. We, uh, you know, we were not putting American flags on the boxes and the trucks that were delivering them. It was a covert CIA operation. We were very careful to not let that escalate into World War III. What we're doing in Ukraine is very different. We're giving them much more weaponry. We're much more involved. The the weapons that we're giving. The Ukrainians require them to be part of a tightly knit web of information services. They're using our satellites in space. They're using our targeting. You've had uh, Biden administration officials bragging about sinking the Moskva, bragging about killing Russian generals, uh, taking credit for that. They took credit for the uh, successful counteroffensive, the Kharkiv counteroffensive last year. These were all articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post. You well, have yeah, Biden- look, you're not going to get me defending the Biden administration. They completely screwed this up. Usually by acting too little too late, that's where we disagree. But I want one more comparison for analogy's sake, mm-hmm. David. Uh, I assume you're familiar with the Yom Kippur War because you're a, a, a student yeah. of history. Are you, are, okay? So Nixon said, in order to save Israel, send everything that can fly. They were being overrun in the south by the Egyptians, on the uh, east by the Jordanians, to the north by the Syrians. And Nixon sent everything that could fly, but not American troops. What is the difference between sending everything that can fly to Ukraine and sending everything that could fly to Israel 50 years ago? Well, as I recall, the Yom Kippur War was only 19 days. It lasted October 6th or October 25th, 1973. So if they were sending everything they got, they better needed to get it there pretty quickly because it was over in they less did. than three weeks. Fine. It was over in less than- saved Israel. It, it was over in, in less than three weeks, and and that's very different than a war that's already lasted a year and a half, and Biden is saying as long as much as it takes for as long as it takes, we're talking about a multi-year war with Russia that could spiral into War Three at any time. That's difference number one. Difference number two, okay, hold I, on a second. D- difference number two, uh, did I get any facts wrong there? No, that's correct. Okay. Difference number two is the role that Kissinger played. He brought that conflict to an end. He sought a ceasefire. Oh, no. No, no. Uh, Nixon won that. Kissinger in his book, Crisis, recounts how he had to be brought into it. I know Dr. Kissinger fairly well because of Nixon Library stuff. Kissinger likes to credit Nixon and go out of his way with crediting Nixon, overcoming the Defense Department's unwillingness to send what were the anti-tank missiles, which were crucial to the win on the ground. But I don't want to defend Biden. Biden screwed it up, David. I want to know well, what but Harry hold Hopkins. On, but hold on, maybe, maybe, I, I think I need to finish making this point. There's no question that Kissinger and Nixon, the administration, played a role in achieving a ceasefire that then became a, a peace deal, and that was taken to the United That's Nations. True. And the U.S. played a the lead role in bringing about that that deal, and they did it in conjunction with the Soviet Union because neither superpower wanted this regional war to escalate into a world war. So they shut it down. No, I don't, okay? I, I don't, I don't want to hold against you because I ran the Nixon library. You may not know this. The Egyptians were in full flight retreat and the Israelis could have gone to Damascus and we stopped them. That's why we got peace is that we stopped Sharon in the Sinai. We stopped their tank battalions advancing any further than the Golan Heights. And Kissinger then did shuttle diplomacy for three years to bring about the deal under Ford. So it's not right, that but easy. You're not contradicting anything I'm saying. What I'm saying is we played the role of peacemaker. Now compare Anthony Blinken's role <laughs> in the current <laughs> crisis compared He's to Kissinger. Bl- Blinken hapless. just gave a speech. Blinken just gave a speech saying that diplomacy was appeasement. He was actually attacking the very idea of diplomacy, which is his job in this conflict. Moreover, but the, the uh, West, the hold on, the West uh, sent Boris the, Johnson to sabotage the peace process that we had at Istanbul 
or I should say the parties had in Istanbul, that was on the verge of producing a peace agreement. So the Biden administration here has done everything possible to perpetuate this war and I'd say not only avoid, but sabotage uh, a, a ceasefire and a peace deal. It is completely different no. than the role that okay, Kissinger and Nixon played. My suggestion is that you cannot get to the bargaining table about a lasting peace, whatever it would look like, unless and until Ukraine achieves strategic momentum. They might have been able to do it last year, and Biden blows everything. And you know what Robert Gates said. He's been wrong about every major foreign policy decision for the 50 years he's been in office. And Robert Gates is right. But you do need momentum on the side of the Ukrainians before you can do any kind of a deal. What I want to ask you and what Vivek um, left unclear with me is if Russia is winning, I mean, really winning, what do you think would happen in Ukraine and what do you think would follow a Russian win in Ukraine? Okay, well, there's a couple of parts here. So for, first, I want to address the, the the idea here that we have to be winning on the battlefield in order to make peace. Um, I th I think that last year would have been the time to when we when I think the the West and Ukraine was on was had that successful counteroffensive in Kharkiv, and the Russians were a little bit on the back foot. That would have been the time to to negotiate. And and actually, General Milley suggested that. Remember, he came out. He was kind of. Uh, went contrarian compared to the rest of the administration and suggested that the Ukrainians had achieved as much as they could on the battlefield and they should seriously consider negotiating. Well, we missed that opportunity. And the reason was that what the administration said is that, well, we're, we're just going to win. You know, we're winning the war. Uh, we're on the front foot and we're going to basically arm the Ukrainians for this spring counteroffensive. And then we're going to push the Russians out of Ukraine altogether. So when you're winning, according to the administration, that's not a good time to make peace because you can keep winning. And then when you're losing, that's not a good time to make peace because you have no leverage. So the fact of the matter is that in the eyes of these people who are conducting our policy, there is never a good time to make peace. And that has brought us to, I think, this disastrous point, which is the Ukrainians are losing on the battlefield with no real prospect right. of reversing what appears to be, at best case, a slow grinding war of attrition and a stalemate. A 1914 and situation. Case. It's a 19, but now I'm not willing to say they're losing. I don't think they're winning right now. And I think the minor advances they've made in the Donbass are not significant. And they've got to show a lot more to get momentum back. But to go back to the Yom Kippur analogy, it was a rout, David. The Egyptians and the Syrians and the Jordanians were in full flight retreat. And the Soviets were threatening to send in Soviet arms unless we stopped them. So that's when Kissinger right. stepped in after we had rearmed them. We're not there now. And I'm not going to defend the Biden administration and Cotton doesn't either. And neither does Mike Gallagher. They're hopeless. They're completely bad. They do everything at the wrong time. They say the wrong thing. And the president is infirm and not in full case. He doesn't really know what he's doing. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not, but I, I just don't think he's actually in charge. And I don't, don't think Tony Blinken can run an apple cart, much less the Department of State. And I do not believe Lloyd Austin has a clue. Have you read this new book yet, by the way? Cobble by Jerry Dunlavy and James Hassan. Had a chance no, to I, read this yet? No, I haven't seen that. It is a catalog of error in the Afghanistan withdrawal, which makes me, it's the only book that's made me actually angry and sad at the same time in decades because the level of incompetence once Biden and team took over uh, from Pompeo and Trump and Robert O'Brien is staggering in the level of its incompetence. And we will get hit out of Afghanistan within five years by the Haqqani Network, Al-Qaeda, ISIS-K. Someone's going to hit us again, 9-11. What are you going to, if you're Harry Hopkins, I want to take David Sachs to being Harry Hopkins. What do you do? About what? Which, about which crisis? Here? About the world. Right now, we're in a very perilous situation. Taiwan is, China's poised to at strike at Taiwan. That's Vivek's view. That's my view. Uh, we're in the uh, Davidson window. We are in a quagmire in Ukraine. Our GDP is falling. We're on the cusp of a recession. You think 2.7% military spending is too high, but as Vivek said, we're down to 275 ships and the Chinese have 450 and they're building eight every year, maybe sometimes 12. We're not building anything. What do we do? We spent all the money on crap. The IFA is just crap. I don't know if you believe me or not. The semiconductor factories are fine, but 90% of it is crap. What would you do if, if Ron DeSantis called you up and he wins? And I'm not for anyone. I'm Switzerland. I might be doing the debates. Uh, it can be Trump, Vivek. They're all welcome here. I will ask them the nasty question. What do we do with this world? 
And what's David Sachs advised them to say? Well, Hugh, we've set the world on fire. So the first thing I would do is act like a firefighter and put out some of these fires. I mean, you, you can't go around the world, destabilizing the world, uh, being hyper-interventionist like we did in the Middle East. We destabilized the whole Middle East. We destabilized Ukraine. We basically I'm sponsored, out. Out. we backed a were, coup there. In were, the Abraham Accords, were the Abraham Accords was, a significant achievement? I, I think that was I think that was a, a a meaningful achievement. I think Jared Kushner did a good job, and I praised him on our podcast for that. I think that was good. I know, and so um, I don't think we destabilized the Middle East. I think we brought Israel and the, uh, the Sunni Arab countries into the first entente that they've had in reality since the cold peace of the Camp David Accord. And I believe that, but for Biden incompetence, we would have Iran on the ropes right now, and they would be begging for a deal. So I think we brought Iran on the ropes, but we again, this team is the worst team in national security history, in, in modern times, at least. But, but, but here, you're using this language like, you know, we've, we've got, we're in, we're in fights with all these countries, you know, we've got Iran on the ropes, we need to keep challenging Russia, we can't make peace with them unless we win decisively, uh, which basically is a recipe for continuous escalation of World War III. Meanwhile, we really do have a pure competitor in China, but we don't have the resources to basically uh, or we should be pivoting to Asia, and, we, and that's been delayed indefinitely because of all these other David, problems. Russia so, so this, this Iran, attitude, this this hardline Russia militaristic and, attitude, has got us in. Not hardline. I'm just a realist. I want my grandkids to grow up in a world where they're safe. I believe that China, Iran, and Russia are locked in an entente that resembles nothing so much as Austria and Germany and Italy, or Austria and Germany, not Italy, in, in 1914. And that we've got we to do drove something. Them. We not drove to... them into each other's arms. Those those three countries don't have that much in common. Okay, the, we, Russia. What? R Russia, what? Russia, and China were not allies during the Cold War. There is historical frictions there. Graham Allison wrote a great piece in in um, foreign policy or foreign affairs, talking about the uh, potential border disputes that Russia and China historically have had and. Should have had, but we have driven them into each other's arms. They see and China us. wants their Siberia back. Yes, they've got actually Chinese maps now with Chinese names next to some of the Russian cities. But Russia is the junior partner. That's basically a mafia state. That's not a Leninist state. China is the big boy. Iran is dependent upon China for all of their foreign exchange currency because of the Trump administration's hard sanctions. I'm just you. You trying to you think that it's a risk game? And I think there's basically China, Russia, Iran, and everybody else, and everybody else better get their act together to contain, like George Cannon said, not to go to war with, but to contain. Do we agree George on that? George Cannon told us we were making a tragic mistake in alienating Russia by bringing NATO right up to the border, which we didn't need to do. He said no, nobody after the Cold War was threatening each other. We could have worked out a security architecture for Europe that basically diffused any tension between Russia and the United States. And instead, we did the opposite. We ignored all of their red lines. We basically staged color revolutions in their backyard. We basically, uh, you know, again, uh, expanded NATO over their many objections. We threatened to take Crimea away from them, which is the location of their major naval base, Sevastopol. It's basically their Pearl Harbor. We have no regard for any of their security concerns. And then when they react negatively to all of this, we invent the story that it's because they're somehow so belligerent and we can't engage in diplomacy with them. The main in 1994. The main mistake the Biden administration made was not taking one of the many off-ramps to this war. We could have negotiated an off-ramp. Now we are stuck in a quagmire over there, and we still have this problem with China, and we still have Iran. So what I would say is, you know, maybe your worldview needs to allow for the possibility of diplomacy more. If you want to put out some of these fires, we have to start using diplomacy. Well, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm a Nixonian guy. I'm a realist. But I do believe that Nixon assessed very carefully, and he set in motion a five-year plan beginning in 1967 and culminating in 1972 to do the flip the script with China. I think Hillary Clinton had that in mind with the reset button. I think Donald Trump had that in mind when it was undermined by the Steele dossier and by the Democratic Party. And I don't think it's now possible given who Putin is and the people he's surrounded by, but it might come back around again. But Iran is a revolutionary regime that will never deal a deal with us. And they are in with China, which will never do a deal with us. So let's go to China, David. Can we agree at least that the American military expenditure on its Navy, which guarantees freedom of the seas and the rise of American capital and the rise of European capitalism, that we have to guarantee free passage of the South China Sea? 
Do we give them the South China Sea or is that part of your diplomacy? I, I think these are very tough questions because I, I do think that we have allies in the region. We do have interests in the region. We have there, Those interests are much more important than any interest we have in Ukraine. And I, I do think we have some real questions there. Um, I, you know, I am basically a realist and I think that we, I think it does make sense to put together a balancing alliance in Asia uh, to yes. to basically uh, contain China to some degree. I um, mean that is basically AUKUS you know, plus India. That is balanced and, power and Vietnam. Logic. Okay, yeah, that, so that's I, I agree with that. But at the same at the same time, I think we have to be extremely careful not to accidentally provoke a war uh, with China because that's the last thing we need right now. And I'm not I'm not totally convinced we would win that war. Um, I, I, so I, I, I don't. Think very, I, I don't. I'm neither. I don't either. I think they've got. Two, 450 ships and and we've got maybe 120 that are deployable. What would you do about Taiwan? Vivek wants to say to them, don't mess with Taiwan until we're semiconductor independent and you can have it. That is controversial, um, it, very controversial, but he said it on Wednesday on my show and it made the rounds. What does David Sachs think we ought to say and do about Taiwan right now? Well, I think we just want the status quo to continue. The status quo has yes. been very good for the U.S. It's been very good for Taiwan. And so we have the status quo of strategic ambiguity combined with the one China policy. It's a little bit contradictory, but we have managed to kind of, you know, muddle through the contradictions. And I think that what we should do is to seek to continue that policy. I would not change it to strategic clarity. I know Vivek wants to do that just temporarily, but I think that that would be extremely provocative in the eyes of the Chinese. I do not think we want to escalate the situation. I do not think we want to blunder into a war. I think that if we can maintain status quo and kick this can down the road uh, another 10 years, like we've done the last 10 years, that's sort of a best case outcome for us. So um, I know that's if not- the, um, They have these giant roll-on roll-offs, David where they have uh, outfitted basically giant ferries with the ability to approach an amphibious landing in Taiwan. If that begins to happen, and an American president it was presented with the problem of shooting first, what would you advise them to do? Let them have Taiwan or shoot first? It's very hard for me to see an American president shooting on a Chinese ship. I mean, you're talking about starting potentially World War III. And I, I think that, as we've seen with Ukraine, the idea that you can fight a limited war, as opposed to the inexorable logic of escalation taking over, uh, I, I think that it's it would be incredibly dangerous. Now, I'm not saying that we don't maintain the optionality. That's kind of the point of strategic ambiguity. I'm not saying that we have to definitively decide not to defend them either, but it it would be, I think, it's very hard for me to see Americans shooting on a Chinese ship and starting World War III. That's, so I think we don't want to find ourselves in that situation is, is the short answer. Um, yeah. You know, look, we, we don't want to... Strategic ambiguity. I think, I think ambiguity we just want to keep our exact... options open. I mean, I... Yeah. If you go back to 1911 and 1914, whether you read Churchill or you read Kenneth Clark, strategic ambiguity was everywhere dominant. And when the German naval law passed in 1900, they began to build their fleet. Strategic ambiguity increased, but people began doing operations and they began planning for war, but no one was clear. Strategic clarity might have prevented the Kaiser from doing what the Kaiser did, and he didn't really understand what was coming, and they ended up with their Ukrainian hardline situation. I think strategic clarity makes a lot of sense and that Vivek just went a little bit too far in putting a, a time limit on it. We've got to deter the Chinese because what happens, this is where I really wanted to ask you, if they invade Taiwan, what do you think happens to the world economy? Well, it's not good, but it, it, but it wouldn't be nearly as bad as if the U.S. and China got in a war, right? Yeah, I mean, but that, what do you think if they... That, if, if we don't, I don't want to get in a war with anybody, but to deter China, we have to say a lot more than strategic ambiguity, and we have to build a lot more, and especially we have to build things under the sea that have the feasibility of striking and demonstrate cyber and satellite capability that do the same thing. That takes a lot more spending than we're currently spending, and what I heard on the uh, All In podcast is you think we're militarists at 2.7 GP, 2%... 2.7% of GDP. And we're not even close to Reagan levels. 
which was, I think, 5.3% at the height of the Cold well, War. Well, spending, we're spending almost a trillion dollars a year on defense, and we don't even have enough ammunition to give the Ukrainians. We're out of 155 millimeter artillery shells. So I don't know what we're getting for all this money. We're getting royally ripped off by the military industrial complex. You know, people have been complaining since the 1970s or 80s about the Pentagon spending $500 on hammers and $800 on toilet seats and that kind of stuff. But now it's gotten much worse since the forever wars. We've been spending trillions on all of these wars that actually they're not even part of the budget. Uh, we spent $8 trillion in the forever wars of the Middle East. What do we get for that? Nothing. All sunk exactly. costs. And you know as well as I do that sunk costs cannot determine going forward. Eight hundred and seventy seven. Yeah, but you can't you can't keep incurring spending. all of these trillions and trillions in in debt for no good reason and then say, oh, that was just a mistake. That's the sunk cost. Don't worry about it. We shouldn't have any lessons going forward. We have no, we, we got to get lessons. The eight hundred and seventy seven billion spending. requires changes to everything, including the triad. My first question to Vivek, my first time I interviewed him, if we have to cut one of the late. Are you familiar with the triad? I don't want to trick you. It's not an ambush. Are you familiar with no, it? I'm not. No. What is that? No, it's the ability to, about. it's our strategic deterrent that is under the water, in the air, and in missile silos. We have a three legs to the triad. Vivek did not know what it was, and he went off to study what it was, because it's crucial to American national defense. The triad has always been what prevents nuclear strikes on the United States. And we've always had that capability. It is increasingly clear to me we can't afford all three legs. And I get the hawks mad at me, because we can't afford all three legs. So I ask people, what do we cut? There are all 20, 50, $100 billion programs, and I think the one we need is under the sea, but I can't get anyone to focus on that. But 2.7% total is not too much. We're just not spending it right. So forgetting I don't, about I don't honestly the think it's 2.7%. So the US, the, well, I mean, just to do back the envelope here, the US economy is about 25 trillion and we're spending, yeah, it's like you said, 877 is the official number, but there's all these other costs that, you know, you could, if you add it in, You'd probably be at a trillion or more. Then you've got all these wars that are done off balance sheet. The Ukraine war is not being taken out of the Pentagon budget. By the way, that would be a much better incentive structure for our military industrial complex. You said to them, your budget is 877. If you want to spend money on defending Ukraine because you think that's the best use of American defense dollars, then take it out of that budget. But we don't do that. We just put it on the credit card. We just put yeah, it on the don't. national debt. But and that is at 33 trillion, that is a nightmare. And the interest rates are gonna go up and it's gonna bring a lot of chaos through the system. But if we had a yeah, national look at, look at our Look consensus. at our deficit. I mean, our deficits are you know well over a trillion dollars a year, okay? And so, and it, so 33 is gonna be 40. 65% of that is gonna be 40. It, sorry, say that again? 33 trillion is gonna be 40 trillion in seven years, maybe right, five. Right, exactly. We already have this massive debt that's already um, starting to increase interest rates, which is gonna have a huge a drag on our economy over the long term. But my point is we're already trillion, we have at least $1 trillion deficits, maybe multi-trillion dollar deficits already. And the majority of that goes to entitlements, which nobody wants to cut. And now we're looking at interest expense on the debt at about a trillion a year. And so when you say that we're underfunded on defense and we're spending a trillion-ish a year, plus all these other, all these wars that we tend to get into as, as bonus spending, I don't think it's a small number. I think it's a massive it's, it's number. Not, and, it's and, a very and, and small by the number. way, to, and, and I think this, they're ripping us up, off royally. I don't, I mean, what are we getting for all that money? You know, again, we certainly, we don't have enough 155 millimeter artillery shells. We don't, we've run out of stingers. We've run out of javelins on and on and on. The reason we've given cluster bombs to Ukraine is we're out. That's the only thing we got left. Your best so, examples, David, if you want your best examples, it's that 40% of our attack submarines cannot get maintenance and that the LCS, which was our most recent commission ship, is worthless and we're decommissioning it after four years. Those are your best examples. The Ford cost an enormous amount of money. We are terrible at this, but that doesn't mean we don't need to do it. We do need to do it. We need to do it better, and we need to up, upend yeah. the Pentagon spending and have better leadership. But I am worried Pentagon about company, China. Hugh, Hugh, hold on. Hugh, I'm a businessman, okay? If, if the Pentagon were a company, what it would be doing is it would be going through its budget, it would be cutting costs, it'd be figuring out what wasn't needed anymore, it'd be questioning the wisdom of investing billions in things like aircraft carriers, which are total sitting ducks. The Chinese can take out a multi-billion dollar aircraft car carrier with some missiles that cost thousands. And we're seeing this asymmetry in- That's incorrect, Ukraine, David. Where you can take out, you can take out a $5 million, you can take out a $5 million tank with 
a drone that costs a few thousand dollars. So that's correct. We're spending the money. We're spending the money on the wrong things. I'm not an expert on military systems, but it seems to me that our thinking on military systems is outdated. I think the procurement process is a disaster. You have this revolving door of the generals who do the procurement in the Pentagon. They all go retire and then join the boards of these defense contractors, which is, and we're single sourced in many of these Your, your best is argument cool. is that the aircraft carrier today is like the battleship in 1940. It has many great capabilities, but they're not the capabilities that we will need in 30 years. And we've got to transition immediately. And we have sunk costs that are holding us from making radical choices. But all of that is true, but we still need to agree on a baseline defense budget. And I believe historically we've done at least 4%. And in doing that, you might be able to get reforms, but the Pentagon isn't a business. It's a bureaucracy run by the constitutional authority that's duly appointed. And you need Congress to do that. So you need politics to change. How do you, I don't think you get politics to change with isolationist arguments. And I think you're making an isolationist argument. Why am I wrong? Well, I'm not, I'm not isolationist. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any involvement in the world. But the way I see it is that, uh, is that we should, don't need to be the first responder in every situation. We don't need to uh, be the, uh, the policeman of the world. I mean, I think that's fundamentally the mistake. And if you look at what we did in World War I or World War II, one of the reasons why we suffered a lot less than our allies is we were late to the conflict. We weren't the first responder. We were the last responder. We were basically the balancer of last resort. The the doctrine that that I believe in is not, you know, either liberal intervention interventionism on the one extreme or isolation on the other. It's called offshore balancing, where basically you do engage in balance of power logic, but you try to look to your regional allies to provide the peace first. And you know that may not be what we did in World War One or World War Two. May not be the most noble. We didn't rush into battle the, the way that you know, the the British did, but we suffered a lot less. It's just a lot smarter. FDR was a genius. Churchill wanted him in earlier and he was a genius. He waited. But at the height of the Cold War, Reagan spent 5.3% GDP and we had just under 600 ships on the ocean because we are an everywhere police force on the oceans. That guarantees free trade, which allows us to prosper. And we cannot let the Chinese build a Navy base in Djibouti We cannot allow them to have Iran as a client state. We can't allow them to threaten Taiwan. We've got to get India into the game. Vivek makes that point repeatedly. But let's just go back to Ukraine and finish this. Reagan Reagan had a 30% debt to GDP. We have, what is it now, 120% debt to GDP? Correct. We have $32 trillion of debt against a $25 trillion economy. So we are much more indebted than we were in Reagan's day. Reagan had a lot more room on the credit card to increase in a, to engage in a defense buildup. And what we need now, I think, is just a lot smarter thinking. You, you mentioned the number 4%. I mean, look, we're at 4% if you do the no, accounting No, we're at 2.7. Right. No, 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 we're, so, we're at 2.7 because within the Pentagon, there's a lot of spending that is not on military needs. I know there's off, off balance stuff, well, then but there's also global it. warming and social engineering. If you get it all together, we're at about 2.5%. And I would leave you to the defense experts to do it, but we are not anywhere near where we need to be. Well, how, about, we how, about we put, how about we correctly uh, budget for Ukraine? How about we correctly budget for all these other items that are downstream impacts of all these uh, wars that we get into, whether it's VA spending and so forth? You correctly Happy to do, do all it that you, budget. You, you correctly you do the accounting. By the way, the, the Pentagon can't even pass an audit. They can't even pass an audit. I agree. So I, but, but what do you so do? The, I mean, yeah, it's look, easy to bitch, but what do you do? Well, we I, can't we, we stop, stop being spending. a lot smarter. Restructure. You do what you do what a business would do. Look, a business that has been failing for 20 years, that has been recklessly spending for 20 years on the wrong things. And by the way, we haven't won any of these wars that we've gotten into. Oh, disagree. Been, David, where were you on 9 11? So we've gotten where nothing. Were you on we've got nothing for this this eight You're trillion wrong. that the Forever Wars cost us. You're we've wrong. Nothing for that. So we need some new yeah. thinking. But 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 that, hold that's on. just but, not correct. That's just not correct. David, we were we were hit on 9-11. We have not been hit in the homeland except for minor attacks with bad human consequences, 11, 15, 30 people. But we have not had a 9-11 since Great. 9-11. Bush Great. Well, that, did a the, good that, job. That was, money, that was money well spent. And I think we should protect the homeland. What we didn't need to do was stay in Afghanistan for 20 years. I think going in to basically get al-Qaeda and get bin Laden 
That was a, a righteous cause. I think we had justification for that. We were attacked. Iraq was based on a big, big fat lie or an untruth, you, you know, if you, if you want. Our entire reason for going in there was totally invalid. I don't know what we were doing with Syria, Libya, and, and so forth. Uh, Ukraine, we could have easily avoided this conflict. And yet we keep blundering into all these wars that then cost all of this money. And then, you know, people come along and say, well, our big mistake is not spending enough. Come on. We need to start being a lot smarter. We need to start being smarter about avoiding these conflicts. There's no reason to get into all of them. We, again, instead of being the first responder, we need to let our allies do some of the work and carry some of the burden. And then we need to spend the money in the right ways. The last thing we need to do is really increase the budget. I'm not saying we have to cut it, but we need to spend that oh. money in much smarter ways. Okay. I, I'm worried that Ron will listen to you. Uh, if he's the president of I, I, I don't want think him, he will. I don't, I'm not that important, I, so don't worry. I, I want to close by asking you about uh, NATO because you've taken a couple of shots at it. I'm very glad Poland's in NATO. Very, very glad. I'm very glad that Sweden and Finland are in NATO. Not too sure about Romania. Not too sure about Hungary. Certainly don't know about um, the, the Balkan nations. But frontline nations, what would you do? We, we've signed a treaty with them. That's a treaty, NATO treaty. If, if the Wagner Group mercenaries invade Poland, will our people shoot them and ought they to? Yeah, look, I, what's done is done is water under the bridge. They're members of NATO. We're not going back. Um, so yes, we are going to defend NATO countries. Um, I think th th we have that obligation to do it, and I think we would. What, one thing I would tell you, though, is we need to keep those countries, especially Poland, on a pretty tight leash because they've been engaging in a lot of bellicosity towards Russia. They've been even there's been uh, quite a bit of talk about them even going into uh, Western Ukraine. And the last thing we need them to do is to start a direct war with Russia that would involve NATO. And I don't think there's any danger involved. of that. And I would agree with you if I thought there was a danger of that. We do not want any single NATO troop to be involved in direct combat with the Russians. But last mm -hmm. question, if Putin were to win in Ukraine, what do you think he would, and stop, not engage Poland, not cross the border Romania, stop there. But if he were to win, topple Zelensky, what do you think the country would look like? In three years. Well, I, I think I, I think some version of this is actually going to happen because I think that we are going to fight the last Ukrainian. We're not going to engage in diplomacy. We're not going to make peace. And I agree with, you know, Professor Mearsheimer's analysis of what's likely to happen, which is the Russians are going to win this war. It's a war of attrition in which they have four or five times the manpower that the Ukrainians do. They have many times the artillery that the Ukrainians do. And there's nothing that the U.S. can do to fix that within the next few years because we've hollowed out our industrial production. And that's been, I think, one of the shockers of this war is just how depleted our stockpiles are. I think it's insane. So what, do you, what event, do you think the Russians will do if they win and occupy the country? Well, the I, I don't think Ukraine. they're going to, they don't want to occupy the entire country because, you know, again, like Mearsheimer says, it'd be like swallowing a porcupine. Western Ukraine is filled with Ukrainian nationalists who are incredibly hostile towards Russia. And the last thing they want to do is try and govern all those people who are inimically or, or hostile towards Russia. So I think I think that ultimately what Russia is going to do is what Mearsheimer said, which is that they're going to try to get to a defensible point, which is probably the Dnieper River. Uh, they might try to take Odessa. They might try to take Kharkiv if they can. And then I think they're you know they'll prob they'll stop and. Um, and I think they but will what will they do Ukraine to the people to... under their control? Because Mersheimer is not an authority with me. I think he's an absolutely wrong on almost everything, but I don't want to argue that with you. I just want to know what you think Putin will do to the people of Ukraine. If you are right, and he is right, and they advance to some line that they consider sufficient, what will they do to the people behind that? And ought we to care? Well, I think the sad reality is that I think that where we're likely to end up if we don't use diplomacy is and so this is not just Putin doing it. We have agency too. We could engage in diplomacy. We could work to resolve this conflict. But I think that where we're going to end up is that this this slow grinding war of attrition will continue. The Russians fundamentally have the advantage in that. They have more men, more artillery, and the Russian the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not going anywhere. We don't seem to have the weapon systems that can really make a difference in this. We can talk about that if you want. But fundamentally, I think the Russians are going to win this war. Again, it'll be a slow grinding uh, victory. And um, it's, uh, it's they're going to win ugly. It's going to, you know, and what that will look like is I think that 
uh, Ukraine will be reduced to a rump state. It'll basically just be the western portion of the country, the eastern part of the country that has a lot of uh, ethnic Russians in it, the Russian diaspora. I think that's the part that uh, Putin is interested in. I do not think they're going to try and govern Ukrainians. I think they're going to try and govern, the, again, this eastern portion of the country. What and I think, that, I, think the sad, I think the sad reality is that I think that Western Ukraine is going to become like the Palestine of Europe or like the Palestinians. They're going to be left in this limbo state of, um, of, of not, having a, a full, not having full statehood, basically. But and, the Israelis um, do not do a buka. The Israelis do not export 16,000 Palestinians and turn them into Jews. The war crimes that Russian have amassed that nobody argues. They've done war crimes and they're on the record. Do you think he'll stop or do you think he'll escalate that? And that the vengeance would be extreme and ongoing and we would stand by and do nothing. Is that what you're suggesting? I I, I think that questions of war crimes are determinations that should be made made by objective third parties after the war. <clears throat> it's very hard. It's hard to make those determinations in the heat of battle because both sides have propagandists who want to basically inflame and inflate those claims. Uh, so things like Buka need to be investigated by objective third parties after the war, and then we can make those determinations. Uh, but but look, I m my take on it is that uh, the Russians have have defined objections in uh, d defined objectives rather in Ukraine. They want to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. They want to demilitarize it. They do not want it to be a military threat on their border. Uh, they said denazification. Uh, which you can treat as propaganda, or you could see it as removing that Azov element from the Ukrainian uh, regime. David, you have uh, but, but, the, but these but hold on, the but these these, these are their objectives, okay? And I do not think that they want to engage in genocide. I think that's hyperbole. And when Zelensky I didn't went say that Vanessa, they are systematically exporting children from Ukraine without their parents, sixteen thousand of them. Buka is not up for grabs. That happened. We've got the evidence, and everyone knows it. And Putin is nuts. And he's also a paranoid and he's also surrounded by yes men and he's got the Wagner group crazies and he's got nukes. I, I really don't believe- This is all the more reason to engage in diplomacy. I don't understand these people who say Putin is a madman. He's nuts. Let's keep escalating this war against him. I Why don't want to do defuse it before we get to war We are not, we, escalating would be to go to Russia. Pushing him back beyond his invasion from 2014 would not be. But David, I, I think we've come to the conclusion where we're not going to agree on this, but I, I'd like you to come back in six months and let's see where we are. But on the defense side, we really have to buy a lot of ships. We have to buy a lot more of the Navy triad and we have to get smart about Taiwan. And I know that you talk to all these guys, they all come and speak to you on the air, talk to them about defense and do it in a fairly serious, sustained way. I have a last question. What is yeah. China's ambition in the world, do you think? Who's? China's. Xi Jinping oh, China's and the ambition. party. Um, I, I think that uh, great powers uh, behave in a certain way, Hugh, and I think that China basically will behave like a great power, um, which is that they will seek to translate their economic strength into military strength. They want to be safe. They want to be secure. Great powers tend to be paranoid about the intentions of other states. And I think that once they translate their economic strength into military strength, they're going to try to, I mean, this is sort of the, the Mearsheimer realist um, view of the world. Mearsheimer is not a realist, but go ahead. They're, they're going to try and translate that military strength into a type of regional hegemony. They're going to try and be the dominant power in Asia. I do not think that necessarily means they want to conquer other countries and uh, rule them, because I don't think that's consistent with Chinese culture and history, but I do think they want to be the dominant power in Asia. And I don't think it's because they're like fundamentally evil. I just think that's because great powers do tend to act that way. That's what the US did in creating a Monroe Doctrine in the Western Hemisphere. So, you know, over time, they're going to seek to assert their own Monroe Doctrine, uh, which, by the way, is also in a way what this Ukraine war is about, is that uh, Russia wants to be recognized as a great power and they want to have some influence over threats on their own border. They do not want a hostile military alliance, the United States setting up shop on their own border. Uh, I think China will has that same objection as well. And over time, they will probably try and seek to push us out of Asia. Um, they, so well, that's, that's probably true, something- But they are, 
You don't think they're a fundamentally evil regime? They're a Leninist regime. They well, put a million Uyghurs into concentration camps. They seized, I'm pet, no, destroyed the culture. I, they are an evil regime. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a fan of communism, uh, Hugh, or or the Communist Party. I'm just saying that I think the behaviors that we're talking about are fundamental to great powers. So um, I just think that as states uh, become more powerful, they do seek to achieve. Uh, a, a more secure situation in their neighborhood. I mean, I think that's the- Well, you, are, you mentioned earlier um, uh, the Thucydides trap that we're in. And yes. I'm, I'm blanking. And so do you think that's inevitable because that ends up in conflict? And it, only once it didn't, when Great Britain was replaced by the United States, did the rising power not get into a war with the falling power. But if we're the falling power and they're the rising power, conflict will happen. Should we shy away from that or should we prepare for it? Well, probably both. I mean, it's an excellent book. I think Graham Allison's right. Um, I think it's very consistent with the realist um, uh, view of the world and the Mearsheimer view of the world. I know you're not a fan of his, but uh, he correctly saw this. Uh, he correctly saw 20 years ago that China would not rise peacefully, that as it gained economic strength, it would seek to translate that into military strength and ultimately seek some sort of regional hegemony and push the United States out of Asia. That view that I think everybody now has, or many, many people have, he predicted 20 years ago. So I think maybe you need to give him a little bit more credit. But but look, I think that um, – all right, where were you? I lost my train of thought here. Just, just that he's evil and where – what should we prepare for a conflict in order to deter a conflict? And that means right. spending so a lot more money. Um, yeah, look, I think the reason why Graham Allison wrote that book is because of the historical pattern. I think that he does not want to see us get into a war – a, a war that the United States could lose that could basically end the world. I mean, the U.S. and China getting into a war would be a disaster. I mean, it, we're talking about the potential end of the United States. We could lose that war. It could turn into uh, nuclear Armageddon. So we should be doing everything we can to avoid that war. And I think that if you read his recommendations in that book, you know, obviously the United States being strong and creating deterrence and creating um, – you know, uh, a balancing alliance, a balancing coalition in the region is part of what we should do. But also, he clearly recommends giving more weight to Chinese interests over time as they get stronger. And so if we're only bellicose, if we're only belligerent, if we are never willing to see the Chinese point of view, if we do not have strategic empathy, we will blunder into a war with them that could be the end of the United States. So look, I believe in peace through strength, but I also believe that we have to be smart, we have to be strategic, and it's not, and we have to have judgment. You know, my big problem with the neocons is whenever somebody wants to exercise judgment, they accuse them of being weak. It's not weak to exercise judgment. It's smart. Oh, I, I don't so, think it is. Uh, I don't think we ought to get in a conflict over whether or not they build a naval base in Namibia or whether they're there in Djibouti with us. I don't want a shooting war. But the number one thing, and I don't think it's right to call Cotton or Gallagher a neocon because neocons are associated with eager for war. Reagan was not. Reagan invaded Granada. That was it. But he but he deployed Pershing twos to Europe. He deployed cruise missiles to Europe and he got a 600 ship Navy. That which has traditionally projected American strength has been naval power and a willingness to engage our allies and fortify them. If we did that, we'll be fine, including drawing India maybe into our coalition like Vivek says and uh, well, let's just leave it there, David, because we are two, two, general... well, two, two quick points, if, if I could, Hugh. So first of all, I think technology constantly changes. And we've seen now from this Ukraine war the importance of drones and the asymmetric nature of the warfare where a $1,000 drone can destroy a $5 million tank. I think a lot of the boats that you're talking about are floating ducks and or sitting ducks. And I think we really have to think about that. I don't know if we have a, a good way to protect them from Chinese missiles. So I think we really have to think through that. Uh, whether that strategy is still the best way of uh, projecting. Thank you so much, David Sachs. Yeah, we'll talk absolutely. about it. All right. Good, good to be with you.